What's up everyone? We're in the midst of launching our new brunch menu and one of the last things we have to do is develop our sourdough waffle and pancake recipe. So I figured this would be a great opportunity to walk you all through the process of developing and testing a recipe from start to finish. So strap in, this is gonna be a long one. Let's go into the bakery and get this recipe started. This is Dave, and as you can see, Dave has been fed recently, right, Kevin? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday? Nice and airy. See if Dave here passes the float test. But first, we gotta construct the recipe. Kevin, we're doing a uh, sourdough waffle recipe test. Well, how would you go about it? Oh god, I guess I'll go about it like doing like a regular sourdough bread. Just start with the starter and then just kind of mix the like the flours and like the salt, and, you know, everything in there. What's your normal fat ratio percent? For waffles, what I normally do is I make like a regular pancake batter. I'll separate the egg and then I'll do the egg yolks into the batter and then I'll keep the white separate and then I'll whip the eggs into like a meringue and then fold it in. That creates like more of a so this is a good time to pause and talk about why we're actually doing this recipe in the first place. As Kevin was just alluding to, you're whipping the egg whites you fold it in to get the nice airy puff right. on, your, on your pancakes. But the thing is, is that has a time frame to it. It deflates over time. Right. So if you're going to do something like that, you definitely want to do it uh, fresh every day. Like you don't want to make the batter and then let it sit for several days at a time because what's going to happen is the air is just going to deflate out of the meringue and your batter is just going to be really dense and heavy. So if you're going to do a, that, that technique where you're folding the meringue into the, the pancake batter or the waffle batter, you want to do it fresh every morning because it's going to give you the, the airiest and the, the freshest you know, batter. So what I found too is even if you do it fresh in the morning, a couple of hours later the batter is deflated, you don't get the same sort of puff. And also too, the, the chemical leaveners, they activate, so like your baking soda, your baking powder, they activate when they hit moisture. So you make your pancake batter at like 7 a.m. right before opening or right at opening, but we run brunch all the way through to 2 p.m. So the problem is our pancake batter isn't consistent in the morning morning to brunch unless we're remixing it every hour or so. The issue with that is when we get busy during the day, well then we can't just automatically remix. So the idea is if we do a yeasted sourdough waffle batter, yeasted sourdough pancake batter, then what we can get away with is retarding the batter in the fridge, pulling out smaller portions to order, and then getting a better end product. That's the idea. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, because you have more time to play with it. Exactly. Well, also too, the flavors are going to develop as you continue to slow down the fermentation process. So I think sourdough might actually be a really good approach. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I think so. All right, cool. Be much better. So when I'm developing a recipe, I like to start by folding the sheet in half, keep things nice and tight. And then we're gonna use the basic methodology. 30% uh, of our flour is gonna come from our sourdough starter. So I'm just gonna write a base recipe. I start with a thousand grams of flour. And then later when we drop this into our recipe uh, spreadsheet, we can scale this up as, as needed. Because I want this to be a higher fat content, we actually are gonna use some, some bread flour in this. So because of that then, 30% of our flour is coming from Dave here, then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say 300 of our flour to make the math easy, which is a little bit less than 30%. 600 starter. Our starter is half water, half flour. So then we have 300 grams of flour coming from our starter. So the recipe then would be 700 grams bread flour, 600 grams starter. I'm gonna start with a baseline percent of 25% fat. So again, based upon our 1,000 grams here, 25 would be two. 250 and our fat will be probably melted butter at first and we'll see how that works. We might need to switch to oil if the butter gets too chunky when it um, sits in the fridge when we're retarding the fermentation. And then hydration rate, you have to take into consideration that 300 grams hydration will already be there from the starter. But with this, we're gonna mix to site. So we'll figure out how much water we want later on down the line. And then eggs will start at 10%, so 100 gram eggs, this is probably gonna be two eggs. Our eggs tend to be 50 grams a piece. We'll do some vanilla extract, sugar at 10%. Let's do malted milk. So we'll do 100 grams of malted milk. We have malted milk, right? Yeah, I think we have some malted milk in the dry storage and powder. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, what am I missing? Oh, salt. 10 grams salt, which will put us at 1%. This possibly will have to go up later on because we're finding this 1% mark off of our 1,000 grams of flour, but because it's a high hydration dough, we're making them batter, it's gonna dilute our salt. So this will probably need to be closer to say uh, 20 grams or 2%. So we'll just kind of put a range here and we'll play this later on. So this is our base recipe and we'll start to mix everything up. So with something like a brioche dough that you're gonna use for hamburger buns, you're gonna have a high fat content, and that high fat content is gonna give mouthfeel and richness. We add the fat at the end of the mixing process when we're making something like a brioche hamburger bun because we wanna give the gluten strands a chance to develop first. So by mixing the water and the flour and letting it sit, the gluten strands cross-link, you get more structure in your dough. If you wanna retard that cross-linking of gluten strands, you add your fat first. So we have our starter dissolved into the water, dissolved with our butter and now we're gonna add our flour and we're gonna go through the mixing process. The idea is, is this is gonna give us a more tender end product, which is what we want with our pancakes and our waffles. We don't want them to be super bready, we want them to be tender and crisp. Now you can already see how yeasty and bouncy this is from the natural fermentation. So we're gonna let this ferment, but first we're gonna thin this out just slightly at 100% hydration right now. And it's looking just a touch on the thick side, but really not by much. So we do have a lot of that melted butter in there. So you know what? Actually, we're gonna go ahead and roll with this for now. Uh, the last step is we gotta add our vanilla, and we're gonna add our vanilla to side because quite frankly, with this size batch, I don't really know how much vanilla I want in there, but I'll know when I see it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place the vanilla on the scale, hit the tear button, send it back to zero, add the vanilla in, and then whatever the negative reading is on the scale left over, that's how much vanilla I added in. Later on, when I do act the actual taste test of the recipe, I can decide if it's too much vanilla, not enough vanilla, and adjust up accordingly. So we're gonna go ahead and cover this in plastic wrap. Let it sit at room temperature for about one to two hours. We're gonna look for this to double in size. And this is just our test to make sure our flavors are right, our textures are correct. We're probably gonna have to go back and adjust some things up and down, depending upon how this test turns out. And then once we have that texture and the flavor correct, then we'll start dialing in the actual execution of it by looking at how we're gonna batch out the dough, how we're gonna let it sit in the fridge, and then at what point the cooks are gonna actually mix in the baking soda uh, into the dough to make sure that they're executing executing it on a consistent basis. So I'm back in the bakery after a busy dinner service. It's been about 10 hours since we last mixed the uh, waffle batter. It's taken a lot longer than I thought it was gonna take, just based upon the activity of the sourdough starter. So that's one thing, when you're working with a sourdough starter, you're kind of working at the pace of the starter. Now once we nail this recipe, we can then look at how often we feed our starter and getting it on a better schedule so it's more routine. So right now it's nice and airy. The last step that we're gonna do is we're gonna add in a little bit of baking powder, a little bit of baking soda, which is going to mix with the acid that's already in our sourdough waffle waffle batter and it's going to give it that final aeration. That's actually one of the nice things about a sourdough waffle and a sourdough pancake is the natural acid that's in the sourdough. It's gonna activate with the alkaline of the baking powder and baking soda and give you that final fluff. So we're gonna go ahead and take this mixture upstairs now, throw it on the flat top griddle, see how it goes as a pancake. If it does good as a pancake, then we'll try it out as a waffle and we'll go from there. You get like, like that twang. Mm -hmm. Could it have been cooked longer? This one could have, but like, I mean, we ultimately, like, I tested it, it came out clean, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it like cooks a little bit longer than you actually think it needs to. Not much, though. That, just a little bit longer, not much. That crunch is nice. Yeah, this one's fine. Mm -hmm. This bottom one, like, very middle tricked us. It's like I didn't get all the way in there. That's pretty good. That crunch is really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's just a little bit longer. 
Yeah, Another absolutely. minute or two. But the texture and flavor are there, yeah. Besides so 25% fat, all coming from butter, about 100% hydration. I think I want to do maybe a little more malted milk in there. 100 grams, so that would be 10% malted milk. Maybe up to like 15 or even 20%. Uh -huh. And then, so swap out the water for whole milk, malted milk. I think we're good. Does it need more vanilla? No. No? No, especially not with that maple. How long do you let the batter sit for with the starter? So this sat for 10 hours, but the idea is the the breakfast guys, right before they, so the bakery would mix it, okay? The bakery would mix a big cambro, they retard it in the fridge, uh, slow down the fermentation. Then they can take the, um, the big cambro, they break it into smaller cambros, probably like eight quarts, mm -hmm. but only like halfway fill it or three quarters fill it. They have the baking soda and baking powder preset and ready to go, and they keep it underneath on the line. Then they would pull out an hour ahead, they would pull out their batter that they need, let it temper, and even if they're working it cold, it's not worst case scenario, you just want the yeast to be a little more lively, right? Stirring your baking soda, baking powder, and you work it right out of the Cambro. I mean, from there you can pour it right. into the into the pancake dispenser. So we can get pretty far ahead on it with the bakery, and then it's just kind of it, an hour ahead on the line. The batter should be good for 48 to 72 hours. From the bakery? Mm-hmm. From the point of mixing, should be good for 48 to 72 hours. And in its prime after 24, right? Or 10 well, 24. yeah, this, this was at room temperature. So yeah, basically the bakery would have to stay a day ahead. Right. So what the guys are pulling at the end of their shift, the portion for the next day is already 24 hours old. So at that point, once it's on their line, they have two days to use it. Right. You guys want to try the waffle? So it's the next day around 1 p.m. We just got done with a, a pretty busy brunch rush, which is awesome. And I was thinking last night, you know, as I'm going to sleep and this morning as I'm waking up, kind of different things that I want to do to switch up our sourdough waffle slash uh, pancake recipe. So one of the first things I want to do is I want to revisit adding the fat or the butter before I add the rest of the flour. I don't necessarily want to do an auto leaf step where we add the flour and let it ferment before we add anything else. So normally in, in the auto lease or auto lye step, you add flour and water and that's it. And you add your yeast and your salt and all your other ingredients later. And that gives the gluten a chance to kind of cross link. It gives you a little bit of a, a better, a sturdier texture. And that's important when you're doing something like sourdough bread. You want the open airy crumb. Uh, it also eliminates uh, a lot of the mixing because the hydration step allows the gluten strands again to cross-link. So I'm thinking that the test that we did last night, where it's a little bit on the gooey side in the middle, even though the toothpick came out cleanly, I think it's because of how I added the fat. So it really did retard the formation of that gluten structure, possibly a little bit too much. Also too, the waffle is gonna be a showcase component in our chicken and waffle dish. We want that sour waffle underneath it. However, if the waffle texture isn't sturdy enough, then the weight of the chicken will crush it. And I think as you cut into the chicken and eat through it, you could have some issues. But the next step is I think I'm gonna try keeping the fat probably at 20 to 25%, sticking with the butter for now, and uh, still using the bread flour. I'm gonna add the flour first, then add the butter. Again, not a full auto leaf step, but by adding the flour before you add the melted butter, it's not gonna coat the flour particles in fat, which is what keeps that gluten from forming in the first place. And also too, uh, one thing to consider is I want to swap out the water for whole milk. And you'll notice that when I use milk in other recipes, like our white bread recipe, brioche dough recipe, which I'll uh, put a link to in the description of this video, we first scald the milk by bringing it to 185 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that does is it deactivates the enzymes in the milk which can break down gluten strands. If I'm using fresh milk, meaning I'm not scalding it first, and then I'm also adding the fat before I add the flour, then I think we're gonna have a really loose unstructured result. So the idea is I'm going for, for both to make workflow easier and to just get a, the, the texture I'm looking for, is we add the flour to the milk, but we don't scald the milk. That's gonna help to kind of restrict some of the gluten structure formation. And then we add the melted butter straight away, mixing the rest of the ingredients, we're just using a direct dough method, meaning we're not uh, you know, holding back any ingredients, we're just mixing it all together pretty much uh, at once. And we're gonna see where that gets us. And I think it should get us pretty close and then we should have just a couple of tweaks here and there to make to get our final result. Now, as I'm mixing up the second batch of batter, I'm thinking to myself, I want it a little bit looser than the last batch, but I'm not sure exactly how much milk that's going to be. So what I'm going to do is place the milk container on the gram scale 
hit the tear button, which will send the weight back to zero. I'm then gonna mix in the milk a little bit at a time until I get the consistency that looks right to me. Once it looks like I'm at the consistency that I want, I'll put the milk back on the scale, and the negative number that reads out is the amount of milk that I just used, so I'll add that to the end of my recipe with a plus sign so I know that I used that much additional milk. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, that's fine, but how do you know how much to add? And the answer is, well, I don't. I just have an idea of what a batter should look like, but it's also why I track everything down to the gram when I'm testing and making a new recipe. The last batter was too thick, which I know was at 100% hydration. This batter may be too thin if I add too much milk, which is now at around 130% hydration, but the point is with each test, I'm getting closer. This is the methodical process of creating and testing your own recipe. Now notice here how much more cohesive and pourable our batter is compared to test number one. That's partly because the hydration is much higher, but also mainly due to how we mix the first batch of batter. In batch number one, we added the fat first, which was the melted butter, which kept the gluten network from properly forming in an effort to give us a more tender product. And it worked, but maybe just a little bit too much. In batch number two, we mixed the liquid with the flour before adding the butter. So you can see it here, it falls in even cohesive sheets as compared to batch number one, which had a more gloppy texture and fell from the spatula in chunks instead of sheets. So version two of our waffle batter has been proofed for about 10 hours now. And you can see it's about doubled in size. So I'm gonna do a test here where we do just this waffle batter without any uh, baking soda or baking powder because the baking soda and baking powder can add another sort of time frame or time limit on our dough. Once we add the baking soda and baking powder to the batter, it's probably about an hour to two hours max that we're gonna get, which we can work into our workflow, but if I can get this to, uh, to puff up nicely and it be fluffy and airy yet crisp on the outside without the baking soda, without the baking powder, then even better. So we're gonna test it first without the chemical leavener and then we'll test it with the chem chemical leavener and then see what we like better. So you can see we probably could use just a little bit more batter, but that's fine. Check it's apart, it smells good, it feels fairly airy. Check the interior, it's really nice and light. Huh, I'm not sure we need the chem chemical leavener. I don't think we need the baking soda and baking powder and we'll test it just to see. I wanna make another waffle though before we add the leavener. It has a nice weediness because of the, um, the whole wheat flour. Hmm. I think too, the texture is perfect as far as, you know, we went through yesterday, we added in the fat to the liquid and the starter before we add the flour, which kind of kept some of the gluten uh, structure from developing. Here, because we have 25% fat, it's still really tender, but it has a good structure and I think that that little bit of extra structure is important for our puff. Now it'll be sort of interesting to see how this works on the griddle because our, our batter is much looser than it was yesterday and you can kind of see how it's a little more pourable. So I think Sean's in his office right now doing an ordering. I'm gonna make one of these for him. We'll go see what he thinks. Now, the thing when you're working with sourdough, sourdough bread, sourdough waffles, sourdough pancakes, your pH is lower, and the lower your pH, the harder it is to brown something. Browning occurs due to the Maillard reaction, and it's the Maillard reaction is pH dependent. So, the lower your pH is, the harder it is to brown something. The higher your pH is, the easier it is to brown something. That's also too why it helps to actually put some chemical leavener in the the sourdough waffle batter. It's going to help with the browning. It's going to help with the crisping by raising the pH back up. It also interacts with the sourness or the acid in the dough, giving you that extra poof. Although I don't really think we need it with this, but just something to keep in mind. So the thing with this waffle maker is unfortunately, you can only control it by setting the timer. We should probably get a new waffle maker or a new waffle iron, because really what you want to be able to do is set the temperature with the temperature dial and also then set your timer. It's been in there for another 60 seconds. We're going to go ahead and check it out and see if it's gotten any better. Yeah, first one came out pretty good. I added more more batter this time. That's without chemical leavener, just straight yeast. I think it needs more sugar. I was thinking that too. I mean, it's hard it's hard to say with the maple and the butter, but I would like it to be a little sweeter. I think also too, especially if we're not adding the chemical leavener, which is gonna help balance the the acid for browning. Then I think bumping up the sugar is gonna help the browning the texture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Some more sugar. I think. Cool, bro. I think besides that though, it's probably good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
So it's not exactly the most scientific method, but I think I'm gonna add about 75 grams of sugar to this dough. I'm shooting for a total 20%. Our original dough, it had 10% sugar in it. And if it drives you nuts, I keep on calling it a dough instead of a batter, nah, it's the same thing. Only difference is batter has a higher hydration than dough, same difference. So I'm gonna add 75 grams of additional sugar because I've already taken two waffles worth out. I'm thinking the sweet spot for this is gonna be about 20%. So we're gonna double our sugar. So on our next test recipe, we're gonna add 200 grams sugar to our test, uh, which is gonna bring us up to the 20% based upon the baked percentage. But right now, I think I'm gonna sprinkle in 75, we're gonna mix it, we're gonna fire another waffle or two, uh, check it out and see if that sugar is about in the ballpark of where we want it. Well, we're getting closer. So much closer. To be continued. So solid couple of rounds of tests. I think uh, one thing I wanna try for the added sweetness is keep it as is, but then sprinkle some turbinado sugar. So when you put in the waffle iron, you sprinkle the turbinado sugar right on top. It kinda gives you that crystallized crunch on the outside of the sugar. Maybe that's where we're missing a little bit of like a crunchy, sugary texture. Would probably be really nice for the waffle. Not sure for the pancake, but maybe the pancake's a little bit more on the savory side anyways. Ah, we'll test. But right now, it's time to go home for the week. Sean and I are gonna watch the UFC fight, UFC 241, and then go from there. And and uh, we'll finish this next week. All right, so day three of our sourdough waffle test. Today I'm gonna try our third version, which I think is gonna be pretty close to our final version, if not our final version. So based upon test number one, we changed our mixing method. In the first test, I mixed the fat in with the starter and the liquid before I added the flour. The fat then coated the uh, flour particles, which inhibited the gluten strands from cross-linking and developing to give us a more tender product. I think that product was a little bit too tender. Cause what happens is you're switching tenderness for structure. So when the, uh, the pancake was expanding, I don't think there's enough air being trapped in it, but the flavor was good. Also, in the first one, we added the baking soda and the baking powder. In the second one, we actually uh, did without the baking soda and baking powder, even though I had it down on the second test. And that's because once you add the baking soda and the baking powder, it's going to uh, reduce the time frame in which we can use that batter. Ideally, if we can get a good uh, yeasted sourdough waffle and pancake batter that we can hold cold, then we can work it directly out of the fridge or we can pull it out in batches and the flavor will continue to develop over time as we slow down that fermentation by using a colder holding temperature, i.e. the fridge. And without the chemical leavener in there, then we're relying just on the yeast to actually leaven our pancakes, to leaven our sourdough waffles. So the idea being that if we can get a good enough proof, we could actually probably end up with a pretty good product that we're gonna have a longer period of time to execute in versus when we add in the baking soda and baking powder, we're probably gonna have a one hour window to actually serve those pancakes and serve those waffles. Also in test number two, we ended up at the end after uh, Sean and I tasted the first round, we ended up upping the uh, sugar amount from 10% to 20%. And then so in, in this test, I'm gonna make the test from start to finish. I'm gonna up the sugar to 20%. Melted butter, I'm gonna actually pop up to 300 grams. And then we're gonna go from there. The hydration rate, so we also added 240 grams in our batch number two of extra milk. So our hydration rate is now a little bit higher. So we're gonna keep the hydration rate the same. We're gonna keep pretty much everything the same. Really what I'm doing is I'm upping the butter or the fat content by about 5%, bringing our total to 300 grams or 30% based on the baker's percentage. Keeping the hydration the same, which I was pretty happy with. And we're upping the sugar to 20% for a little bit of added sweetness. Now one thing that we're gonna try as well with the waffle specifically is in Belgium, they actually sprinkle pearl sugar on top of the waffle sometimes when they put the batter in the waffle iron and it gives this really cool like half melted half crunchy sugar coating i think the turbinado sugar sprinkled right on top of the waffle batter in the iron is going to give us possibly a really cool crunchy crispy malty texture so stay tuned test number three coming up So while I was mixing the waffle batter today, I had the butter on the stove behind me on our induction burner, and I thought to myself, you know, hey, it's been a while since you checked that butter. You should check to make sure it's not burning. But then I thought, you know what? That could be actually really good is to have a little bit of brown butter in your waffle dough. And the, the reason why I like that idea is because at home, I normally put almond extract in my uh, pancake batter and waffle batter. So I like the nuttiness that it gives. And that complexity and depth of flavor is kind of missing from this, the 
first two previous waffle batches that we did for our test. But the reason why I hesitate to add almond extract or walnut extract to the waffle batter is due to nut allergies. I would hate for somebody to come into the restaurant, order a sourdough waffle, order a sourdough pancake, not think that, hey, there might be some uh, nut extract in there. And then, you know, now their Sunday brunch is ruined because they're going to the hospital. So I did half brown butter, so 150 grams brown butter and 150 grams regular butter because uh, I didn't want a, that nutty flavor to be too assertive. But I have a sneaking suspicion that when I test these waffles, uh, I might actually want more brown butter. So we'll have to see. But when it comes time to actually roll this recipe out onto our menu, it's gonna have to fit into our daily workflow as well. So that's what we're testing today alongside to see if we can hit that final texture is how does this gonna fit into our daily workflow? So if we do this whole thing right, not only will these sourdough waffles and pancakes be easier to execute, they'll be a higher quality, they'll have a, a great airy texture on the interior, a nice brown hearty crust, and they're gonna have a more complex flavor. So it should be a win-win-win all the way around, which is always what you're looking for. More efficient execution with better flavor. So we're gonna let it, again, sit overnight. We're test these tomorrow. I'm pretty excited to see how they turn out. If this isn't the batch, if this isn't the recipe, I mean, I don't wanna jinx it, but I'm thinking that we're probably pretty close. Another one or two tests after this, and then we can do some tweaking along the way. Uh, basic flavor structure tweaking, but I'm pretty sure test number three is gonna be the one. So it's the next day, we haven't seen a ton of activity with our waffle batter, but I think that's because my starter was a little bit tired yesterday when we mixed the dough in the first place. But that's okay, we're still gonna give it a test. We're gonna give it a test straight from the cold, and we're also gonna give it a test after it's room temperature for a couple hours, see if we can activate that yeast a little more. And then also you'll notice that when I put this into a container, I'm gonna weigh it out so we can find our accurate yield, so we can see how many waffles we yield from this one recipe, which will then later allow us to figure out how many waffles we go through a day, and then scale it up from there. All right, so a couple of things. Consensus is we don't really need the uh, turbinado sugar on top. Doesn't really add much, and we've already kind of put these waffles on the borderline of sweet, which is what we want, especially when it's paired with the fried chicken and we have a spice syrup in mind. Also, to the, the fat from the butter that's naturally spread on here is gonna kind of deaden some of that sweetness. Overall, good multi-flavor. We like how the wheat from the sourdough starter hits. The acid helps to balance out the sweet, so you really get a nice, complex waffle. Sean and I were also just talking about the execution of this, with any bread product, what happens is your crust doesn't fully set up until your bread cools. And the interior of your bread doesn't fully set up until your bread cools either. Same thing with your waffle. So when you're baking a baguette, when you're baking a loaf of sourdough, you usually want to let that cool to room temperature so the crust sets and becomes crackly and the interior is fully gelatinized and not doughy. So this waffle, it will set faster than bread, but you won't really get your maximum crust on the waffle until after it's cooled for a couple of minutes. Perfect for us in the restaurant because we make the waffle, we put it on a plate, we stick it in the window. It takes a server a couple of minutes to come grab it and run to the table. But for your own knowledge, when you're making these at home, you're gonna wanna let them sit for a little bit too. Also, if you're making this for a handful of people, you can fire all your waffles ahead of time, you know, 20, 30 minutes before you're ready to serve. Have your oven on at like 325, 350. Put them on a baking tray and flash them in the oven. That way you have hot waffles that you can serve all at once. But we're pretty happy with this. The final test is uh, throw these on the flat top, see how they perform. But pancakes are pretty straightforward stuff. So as long as they, they rise, they have a good flavor, I don't foresee us having to change this batter at all. So waffle test complete. So what did we learn? When you're using a chemical leavener, you always have a smaller window of time for execution, which is why we started to do the sourdough waffle recipe in the first place. By using a natural yeast and sourdough starter, our waffles are gonna have a much broader window of execution, and they're gonna have a better, more complex flavor. Speaking of a complexity of flavor, 
by using the sourdough starter, we can actually retard the dough for up to 72 hours overnight while putting the dough in the fridge. We're gonna have a more complex flavor, a broader window of time to execute the dough, and a much better end product. Win, win, win all the way around. We also learned that the Maillard reaction is pH dependent. So just like this piece of meat that we're searing here, the pH is going to determine the actual temperature at which it browns. So with our sourdough waffles, because we're using a natural sourdough starter that's rich in acidic and lactic acid, the pH is much lower than your standard pancake batter. And because of that, you're going to need a hotter flat top, a hotter griddle, or a hotter waffle iron to get the color on the crust that you want. We also learned that fat content and how you incorporate it into your doughs and batters matters. If you add your fat to your liquid before you add your flour, the fat will coat your gluten strands and give you a more tender product. But sometimes you can take it too far like we did in our first test, which made it too tender and so tender that the gluten structure didn't fully form, so we weren't able to trap the air as the pancake and waffle rose, which gave us a denser texture. So instead what we did is we used more fat in our formulation, we added the fat after we added the flour to the milk, and we ended up with a tender texture that still had enough structure to hold the air and rise to give us the best of both worlds. Which leads me to perhaps my favorite thing that we learned during this entire process, which is brown butter is amazing in waffles and pancake batter. In fact, this is something that I'm gonna be playing with a lot more. Brown butter brioche dough, brown butter baguettes, brown butter bread, brown butter everything. It's amazing, it adds a beautiful, nutty, toasted, roasted, buttery flavor to just about anything. And this all came from me forgetting that the butter was on the heat and making a mistake which leads me to actual recipe development. Fail often and fail quick. You wanna to mix to sight, season to taste, but track everything to the gram because you never know when your next mistake is gonna be your next stroke of brilliance. In fact, one of my favorite sauces that I ever stumbled across was when I accidentally spilt my miso broth into a chicken and shallot reductions. It's still a sauce that I use to this day. So don't be afraid to get into the kitchen, work out your ideas, fail often, fail fast, and come up with the next new thing. So what's next? Well, now that we have a recipe that we like, that we've tested, that we know works, we have to standardize it in our recipe spreadsheet. Now I'm gonna do a separate video on how this spreadsheet actually works, but the basic gist of it is this, you take your test recipe that's measured to the gram, you place it into your original test recipe area, you then input your yield, which is why we weighed our batter and also we weighed the portion size of our waffles when we were scooping them into the iron. Your test recipe will then auto-populate the left-hand side of that sheet, which is your main production side. You enter in your instructions, and then notice when you scale up and down, you can change your yields. You can say, well, instead of a 290 gram waffle, I have a thinner waffle iron, so I'm gonna need a 150 gram waffle. Oh, and by the way, instead of yielding 10 waffles, I'm gonna need to yield 100 waffles. You enter in those numbers and you can scale up and down. This is why we always standardize our recipes by the gram, by weight, because it makes it much easier to put that recipe into production to make sure that recipe is consistent every single time, which consistency is the key to any successful cooking, and it's way easier than scaling volumetrically using ounces, pounds, cups, all that good stuff. And even though we have a recipe that we love, that we're ready to put on our menu into production, it never stops. We're always gonna keep on testing. In fact, I had a whole conversation with Kevin in the bakery regarding French meringues and Swiss meringues and Italian meringues and how adding a meringue to our pancake batter, whisking it in or folding it in could actually enhance our poofiness. I went through the whole process, I tested it. I ended up liking our original number three test batter better at this time, but it's a concept that I keep on wanting to test. We could always add fresh vanilla bean, we can swap out our granulated sugar with maple sugar. There's any number of modifications that we can make to this recipe, both flavor structure wise and technique wise to enhance it or change it to our liking. And I hope that's what this video inspired you to do. This whole process was about way more than just creating a sourdough waffle recipe. It's about showing you how I go through the R&D process, test things, structure things, retest, until I find a recipe that I really like. And in the process, 
I am releasing my voice as a chef. And that's what I want for all of you watching. I want you to have the confidence to walk into your kitchen to test things out and make recipes your own. So although this is a great waffle and pancake recipe, I hope to hear from hundreds if not thousands of you telling me what changes you've made to this recipe to make it your own that make it even better. That's it. The only thing we really have left to do is to finish frying our chicken and present our chicken and waffles dish.